want to live a holy life, and I'm sure you do too. I feel confident also that God wants Christians to lead holy lives. And sometimes the call of holiness is clear. Don't lie, steal, or commit adultery. But sometimes you come to the Bible with a definite question. What should I do in this situation? And you don't get a definite answer. You must weigh principles and consider canonical contexts and compare covenants. A guide can be very helpful, someone who is adept at bringing the whole Bible to bear on your ethical question. One such guide is Jonathan Lundy, who insisted I can call him John, which I will endeavor to do despite my upbringing. He has written a book, I've got it on the screen behind me, a book of biblical theology called Following Jesus the Servant King, a biblical theology of covenantal discipleship. I found his work very helpful, even just its basic premise put some key concepts together for me. It's one of those premises that will get you thinking and exploring for years to come, even a lifetime. It's my joy then to have Dr. Lundy, John, on the Bible Study Magazine podcasts. Now, John, I like to let my guests introduce themselves by telling us, how do you serve the body of Christ? Well, Mark, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a really interesting question. Um, I think primarily, I shouldn't say primarily, I would say foremost, uh, I strive to be uh, a good husband and a, and a good father. Uh, I've lived long enough to see the, um, the long fruitfulness of a, of a faithful family. Uh, and so I think that's one of the primary ways I serve the body of Christ. But most of my time is spent um, working at uh, Biola University. I, I teach uh, biblical studies to undergraduates and uh, it's, it's just a delight uh, to do that. I do a little bit of publishing. I work in my uh, local church at times with uh, serving on committees, being an elder at times. Uh, but my main role is an undergraduate professor. Your, uh, your work, your, your title included Biblical Studies, and the aspect of Biblical Studies that we're interested in this third season of the Bible Study Magazine podcast is Biblical Theology. And you've edited a, se edited a series of books called Biblical Theology for Life that we'll talk about in a minute. But I've been asking every single guest on this season of the podcast to simply define for me, what is Biblical Theology? Yeah, biblical theology is a specific approach to, to, to studying scripture uh, with uh, a concerted effort to let the, the authors of each individual book or letter speak in their own voice to their own audience. So um, the, the way you go about doing biblical theology is not starting with a whole bunch of systematic categories or philosophical categories. Instead, you're you're inductively looking at the biblical text and, and asking uh, what the, the author would say about a particular topic. But, but to understand it as much as we can within the author's own historical context. Um, but it's not just history, it's not just how they understood the words, it's not just the political stuff that was going on or whatever. It's also covenantal, and that's going to be obviously a big uh, topic of our conversation so that I understand the psalmist within the Old Covenant. And so I understand his comments within that framework. So let's say I wanted to uh, look at the uh, biblical theology of remnant in Isaiah. I would look at all the passages that have that word, but also that concept in Isaiah. And I could restrict it to Isaiah and just let Isaiah tell me what he believes regarding remnant. If I wanted to, I could then expand it to the prophets and the rest of the Old Testament and then indeed the whole Bible. But when you move from the Old Testament to the New Testament, there are other things you really have to pay attention to, and that is uh, the covenantal shift. Some things do stay the same, th some things do change. And so once you are sensitive to all of those things and you lay out all of the passages that talk about remnant, you begin to then map the long salvation historical development of that theology. And, and, and there are going to be places of diversity. There's going to be places of tension. And biblical theolo theology strives to retain those things instead of sort of smoothing them all out in a systematic category. 
or a framework. So, so biblical theology tends to try to describe the Bible's um, uh, approach to a particular topic. And traditionally understood, it's just descriptive. But my conviction is that because there's a, a hortatory or a, 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 an imperative nature, exhortational kind of uh, dynamic to scripture, that if we don't take that last step to talk about how that applies, how that contextualizes in my day to day, um, then I haven't really finished the job. So that's my particular um, conviction that biblical theology has to result in practical application. I, I could not agree with you more, and that's why I opened the way I did. I want to live a holy life. Again, I presume that every true Christian and dwelt by the Spirit who's listening to this podcast or watching it on YouTube has the same desire because that is the desire placed into me by my membership in the New Covenant. That's what Ezekiel 36 and other passages promise me, Jeremiah 31. You have, uh, you know, been true to your view here by producing this series of books called Biblical Theology for Life, in which your own book, Following Jesus, the Servant King, a Biblical Theology of Covenantal Discipleship, appears. I also read uh, Brian Rosner's book in your series. I'm going to interview him in not too long, Lord willing. Just talk to me about this series. I think you've already answered the question I wanted to ask in a way. Why did you think it was necessary? But let me say this a little more specifically. What gap did you see that this series is intended to fill? Yeah, uh, biblical theological books, um, unless you're a specialist, they tend to be kind of dry. Uh, kind of uh, tedious, kind of detailed. Uh, and so it's really difficult to um, encourage non-specialists to read them. Uh, and oftentimes they're written for other specialists. So what we were trying to do with this series, and it, it wasn't my idea. Zondervan came to me and asked me if, if I would be willing to consider being the editor. And I should let you know, we have seven more volumes in the pipeline. So that's wow. much more to come. I did wonder that. Yeah, we've got some really good topics coming up. Um, but what we wanted to do is, is to provide a, a biblical theology series that had a, a similar macro structure so that readers could kind of understand what they were going to get. And so, you know, I came up with this cueing the questions, arriving at answers, and, and reflecting on rel relevance sort of framework. And so all authors have to fit into that, but then they're free to organize within that framework the way they want to. But the key that we wanted to especially uh, land on is the reflecting on relevance, uh, so that uh, readers would understand they're going to get good, solid biblical theology here, and it's going to be wrapped around very defined questions, but it's going to land in a very relevant application of that theology to modern life. So that's, that's really the gap that we really wanted to fill. The first book that I picked up in the uh, the series that you edited was the one by Brian Rosner, and I've read some stuff by him, like in the New Studies in Biblical Theology series. His book on Paul and the Law was really excellent. I would not have called it dry at all, but I would have called it academic. And there was a different feel in the series that you edited. Not at all that it was now not academic, but he was definitely aiming at relevance right from the get-go, and I really appreciated that. Now, I have to ask, in the, in the new series of books, the, you know, the, the seven more books that you've got planned, pretty please will you tell me, is somebody doing a biblical theology of why my political opponents are wrong in their response to the COVID crisis? I'm just asking. We haven't yet gotten that one under contract, so no, that one's not yet there. Still we'll looking for the right writer. All right, I'll do it. Okay, you, I'll, I'll sign on. Let's get back to the, your book in this series, Biblical Theology for Life. In the intro of your book, there were some words that, I, that really struck me. You said, our goal will be to discern what it means to live in the new covenant, graced by the servant, and there you're talking about Jesus, and summoned by the king, and you're still talking about Jesus. How do these two biblical realities hold together, you wrote? How can I be saved entirely by God's grace in Christ, while at the same time be summoned to absolute righteousness? I think of uh, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And you said, how can Jesus' teachings be reconciled to Paul's in this regard? Doesn't Paul make it clear that the law's demand has come to its end in Christ? 
Isn't it the case that Christians are no longer under the law's supervision, you wrote? I'm giving an extended quote because it's so good. We will discover, you said, that the answers to these questions are to be found in what it means to be in covenant with God. So please, Dr. Lundy, John, can you give a brief sketch of what you mean here before we dive into some more particulars? Of course, Mark, I, this is, uh, I'll try to be as brief as I can because I know we have uh, more good things to talk about, but it really comes down to this notion of living in covenant with God. I don't really know why it has happened. I have my hunches, but for some reason, the notion of covenant has almost disappeared from uh, modern Christian parlance. It's just not something that we t uh, normally think about, normally um, uh, uh, reflect on or uh, intentionally live in. Um, if you were to ask most modern-day Christians what it means to live in the New Covenant, they probably would say something like, well, it means that Jesus died for my sins and I don't have to bring a lamb to church. I can eat shrimp now and maybe even get a tattoo. Um, but um, that would be probably what most people would be able to say. And they would assume that what has happened is the legalism of the Old Testament has now been replaced by the grace of the, of the New Covenant. Um, and, and so what I think has happened is, is people have lost what it really means to live in covenant with God. All of the biblical covenants are grounded in grace. They're, they're, God is always the initiator. He's always there first, whether it's creating, providing, uh, redeeming, uh, um, promising. All of those are, are aspects of the prior grace in all of the covenants. But covenant, as it is defined in scripture, as well as in ancient world, always has a response, always a response to that prior grace. Uh, and, and so what you find in, um, in the biblical covenants is that in response to the grace of God, there is the demand to respond with faithfulness, the demand to respond with righteousness. So what I did is I, is I tried to help um, the, the readers of my book understand that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the grace of the Old Testament, all of the grace of the covenants. And I subsumed that role under a really important uh, figure from Isaiah, the servant of the Lord, who does for Israel and for us what we could not do for ourselves. That's the prior grace. And then there's also the other side, and that is the demand of righteousness. And, and I subsumed all of that under the role of of King, Messiah, because Jesus also fulfills all of the demands of righteousness that you find in the covenants. So uh, when I think about discipleship, if I want to be robustly biblical, I, I really need to understand I'm following Jesus, but he has two massively important covenantal roles. One is providing the prior grace of the covenants, and then secondly, summoning me to follow him as my king. Now, there's also another dimension that I should mention here. We don't need to get into it too much unless you want to. But the notion of the covenant shift from the old covenant to the new covenant involves not just a change of covenant, but a change of kind of covenant. Whereas the old covenant uh, was uh, what was known as a conditional covenant, the new covenant is what is known as a grant covenant. Do this and live. Yes, that's, you go to Deuteronomy. I mean, you, you just see the Deuteronomy 28 list of blessings and curses. If you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. If you do this, these great blessings are going to come. In other words, in a, in a conditional covenant, the ongoing experience of the blessings. Now remember, it's grounded in grace. Israel didn't merit becoming uh, the people of God. God chose them. God delivered them. God uh, was always the initiator. But now, if they were to remain in the blessings of that covenant, they had to respond with faithfulness. So the, that's where the conditional part comes in, that where uh, if I continue to follow as a nation the, the, the law, obviously within the context of the ongoing grace of the temple, then those blessings would continue. But if the nation continues to resist and reject uh, God's call to faithfulness, even though they've got the temple, they start treating the temple flippantly. And once that happens, there really is no more atonement for sin. And then the curse of the law, the curse of the covenant comes down. That's the conditional nature. When you get to the New Testament, 
what you have is that Jesus uh, has fulfilled all the conditions. He's actually lived the life that we could not live. And therefore, all of the conditions are fulfilled, and that representative righteousness now is available to me by faith. It's, it's granted to me by faith so that my continued blessings, my continued experience of the blessings of the new covenant are not tied to my righteousness. They're tied to Jesus. And as a result now, that, res that, that gives rise to all sorts of things that Paul says with regard to not being under the law but under grace, I think he's really talking about these two different kinds of covenants. And once you understand that, you really begin to understand the gospel at a, at a far more organic level in, in the scriptures. This is biblical theology. This is what it means to look at the whole sweep of scripture and try to apply it to your question. You know, anytime somebody says, this is the key, you know, this is going to get you into the deepest understanding of the gospel, part of me is really interested, like, yes, yes, you know, whatever it takes for me to understand and then apply these things. But then <clears throat> I want to be maybe a little bit skeptical. I don't want to just accept any key that somebody offers me. But the very fact that biblical theology has been able to demonstrate its value in so many ways, when we look at that Rosner book on Paul and the Law, it's that biblical theology angle that I found to be the most helpful for me, you know, putting my understanding as a New Testament New Covenant believer of the law, putting that together. When it, we talk about the Old Testament stories, which for a long time were just morality plays for me, that, you know, morality plays that really happened. I, I believed my whole life that they really happened. But biblical theology came along and said, no, I mean, they are teaching morals, that's true too, but they're caught up in this grander narrative and that's where they get their true significance and often that's where the grace comes from. I mean, biblical theology has demonstrated that it really is a key because it's not actually something, anything beyond just reading the whole Bible. So when you say you're going to understand the gospel better through this lens, I'm just going to say amen. I think that's really true and you demonstrate it in your book. And let's get into some of the particulars in your book in which you demonstrate this truth. I'm going to ask you your own three questions, the ones that structure your argument. So what could an author desire more than to have such a softball pitch <laughs> given to him? First, why should I be concerned to obey all of Jesus' commands if I have been saved by grace? Dr. Lundy. Well, it really, to answer that question, you really have to come back to what God is ultimately interested in, uh, in the world that he's created. I think if you go all the way back to Genesis 1, uh, verse 28, you have the great mandate. Uh, the, the whole notion of um, be fruitful and multiply, uh, rule over the entire earth. So what God is doing is he's inviting his image bearers, which is really, really important. Um, he's, he's inviting them into co-reigning in the world uh, and, and, and to do so in his image. So there you have this, this notion of, of morality, this notion of faithfully reflecting the character of God in the world. And if the world is filled with his image bearers, stewarding the earth, reigning over it in his image, the world will be filled with the glory of God. So I really think that's what God is, is interested in, in this created order. But he's not interested in zapping us into that. He's not interested in coercing us into reflecting. And I don't think that kind of relation, uh, relationship, that kind of righteousness would be meaningful to God. And so how does he bring it about? Well, I think that's the long story of Scripture, and that is the slow uh, redemption, recovery, transformation of his image bearers into his character. And, and when that happens, then finally the kingdom arrives. So that's really what we're talking about here. So when we think about uh, the grace of God in salvation, we oftentimes just focus on the forgiveness part and we run right to the cross. Uh, I, I tell my students frequently that we overemphasize the cross. Um, uh, he, he does more than just die for us. He actually lives in our place. Uh, and, and that forgiveness is not just to save us. It's also then to move us into transformation. 
Uh, and that's where the whole notion of the kingship comes in. Yahweh is the king of Israel, commanding and demanding faithfulness so that his redeemed, transformed people will actually reflect the character uh, of, of, of God. And obviously this is where the, the, the role of the spirit comes in. We can talk about that. And, and, and in this era, which is the inaugurated kingdom, it's only going to be progressively true. But God is patient, and he's slowly transforming us into his image, which will finally be perfected once the final kingdom comes. But I think when it comes, that righteousness will be meaningful to God for eternity, because it wasn't coerced. It was enabled. It was won in the context of covenant that we have today. The second question that you posed for yourself and then used to structure at least portions of your argument in the book was what is it that Jesus demands of his disciples? So you follow on, follow on that first question, you know, why should I even have to obey what Jesus says with what is it actually that Jesus says? What is he commanding? And you referenced a book that I know was a uh, award winner years ago and something that was impactful for me, John Piper's What Jesus Demands of the World. That book was really excellent. How do you answer that question? What is it that Jesus demands of his disciples? I, I've heard it said so many times that uh, God doesn't demand perfection. And, and, and there's, a, there's obviously an element of truth to that. But when I start looking at the Old Testament, uh, Deuteronomy 6, for instance, where it's the great commandment that Jesus identifies that we, were, we are to love the Lord with, with all of our heart, or all of our soul, and all of our strength. Uh, and then the second commandment that Jesus identifies, loving our neighbors as, as ourselves. And then, of course, you have uh, Jesus in, at the end of... Uh, the first major section of the Sermon on the Mount, you have Jesus in Matthew 5, 48 saying, be perfect, teleos, as your right. heavenly Father is perfect. Um, I don't think he's saying be mature, <laughs> like God is mature. I think he's talking about be perfect. And he's echoing Leviticus again, uh, that where, where God says, be holy, for the Lord your God is holy. So there is this, this call to reflect God's character perfectly. Um, so he does demand perfection, but it's not just simply um, a matter of us laying out the commandments now and, and that we are to do them. Uh, now, Jesus obviously is the good news here. Uh, in Matthew 5, 17, he says something unbelievably important. He says to, to some of his detractors, don't think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Uh, well, what does that mean? He actually fulfills the law in more than one way. We normally think right away of the cross, and that's hugely important. He fulfills the Old Testament sacrificial system. That's now fulfilled and now obsolete because of Jesus. But as I said, he also fulfills the law by doing it, and that's going to be unbelievably important for understanding then this notion of a grant or, or grace-based covenant all the way. But the third way in which Jesus fulfills the law is by his teaching. In fact, in Matthew 5 there, what follows that verse are the, what are called the antitheses. You've heard that it was said to those long ago. But I say unto you. From the law. Yep. But I say to you. And the authority that Jesus carries there when he says that is emphasized in the Greek, but I say to you. So Jesus is taking Mosaic commands and then mediating its final form. And so there's another way in which Jesus then fulfills the law. So when we ask what God, does, what God demands of us, we really in the New Covenant have to ask, okay, what has happened to the commands of the Old Testament as they've passed through Jesus' fulfillment? What changes occur? And the reality is not every command gets changed the same way. In fact, some commands don't get changed at all, and others are completely done away with. And so that's why I gave three metaphors in the book, three metaphors that have to do with light, to try to illustrate three of the main ways in which the law commands are transformed or at least affected by their fulfillment in Jesus. The first is this, this notion of a filter. And so uh, a, a filter, if you think of, of sunglasses, it, it blocks certain um, uh, wavelengths of, of light so that the harmful UV rays don't hit our eyes. 
but other things are passed through. So when you think of Jesus as the filter, obviously the most important one is, is the sacrifices. Because of the nature of Jesus' fulfillment, it's no longer appropriate to bring my lamb to church. But you that wavelength of light gets blocked as it tries to pass through the lens, and Jesus is the That's one who right. blocks it. That's right. Because of the nature of the fulfillment, it's not just, oh, I'm tired of animal sacrifices, let's get done with those things. No, it's because Jesus fulfilled it. That's always got to be the, the question. What has happened in the fulfillment in Jesus for this to actually change? So we can also think about food laws. We can also think about circumcision. We can come back to those later. Another way that Jesus fulfills it is by uh, uh, functioning as a lens. Now, those of us who are um, nearsighted or farsighted or whatever, we have to have lenses to focus the light in the right way so we can read or see or whatever. Um, when I talk about Jesus as the lens, what he's doing is he's, he's refocusing the original intent of the command back in terms of what it was originally intended to be as opposed to the blurring effect of the traditions that the, that the rabbis and the teachers of the law had overlaid on the command, undoubtedly well-meaning, but oftentimes losing what it really was all about. So what does Jesus do when he functions as a lens? He recovers it. And so the classic example here is, is Sabbath. You, you have these massive rabbinic teachings of what it means to work on the Sabbath. And Jesus, Jesus just cuts through all of that and recovers again the essence of Sabbath. And so now... The Sabbath was made for man through. and not man for the Sabbath. Exactly. That's what he's getting at. Um, so there are certain commands that just com completely pass through Jesus, now clarified back into their original intent. But now, that needs to be what I listen to. One of those is honoring my parents. So that, that comes through in a way that, that is not changed, but is re-clarified. And then the last way is, is prism. If you think of a prism, it, light comes in and then it, it, it gets refracted. It gets changed in its trajectory. Uh, and, and the main way in which I, I think that applies to what Jesus does is when he takes an Old Testament law and he actually raises the bar. So think about yeah. the command um, against murder. You know, he says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not murder. And he talks about the, the penalty. But I say to you, don't even be angry. And then he equates anger with murder. Well, what has he done? He's taken the physical act of taking someone else's life and, and, and backing it up all the way into the internal, emotional um, vitriol that would eventually give rise to that kind of action. Well, that means then that Jesus is calling for a greater, a higher demand of righteousness from his people than was even true of the Old Testament. So that's when we start talking about what Jesus commands of me. So what I have to do then with each command is ask, do biblical theology. What happens to this command as it passes through Jesus? What happens? And, and discern what happens in each one. And whatever ends up on the other side of Jesus, that's what should be in my heart. So you referred to Jeremiah 31, the great New Covenant passage. The law doesn't go away in the New Covenant. It's written in my heart and in my mind. Well, what should be written in my heart and my, in my, my mind as a new covenant believer is what happens to the law as it goes through Jesus. And so that means then I, I have a bit of work to do. Yes, that's right. And so we have sort of a, a movement. I, it's been afoot, you know, my entire adult life, I've been aware of people who are doing, I think you would describe it later as, you know, lowering the bar. So when Matthew 5 comes along, the whole Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus issues these commands, uh, a certain brand of ultra-dispensationalist of the past will say that these commands no longer apply to us, that was a totally different dispensation. Or a certain brand of Lutheran uh, currently, and I'm not trying to spray shotgun blasts here or a birdshot, whatever, hit everybody, but a certain brand of Lutheran can say, oh, the only function of these mor moral demands, these high demands, is to make us run to Christ because we realize we cannot do them. But I, I think the consensus evangelical view and, in a way, the commonsensical, straightforward view of the person who picks up his Bible, he's been told, you're a Christian, read your Bible, he comes to what Jesus says, he recognizes, okay, yes, these are high bars, but this is my master telling me to do this stuff. That actually leads right to the third question that you posed for yourself and then answered in your book, and I'll pose it to you again. How can the disciple 
obey Jesus' high demand. There's that high bar. While nonetheless experiencing his yoke as light and easy. I mean, that's what he says. Come, all who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How does that paradoxical statement make any sense? No, Mark, that's, that's one of the driving impetus behind my, my research in this because I don't, I don't like reading the Sermon on the Mount very often because I can never feel very good about myself uh, when I actually read it and allow the, the, the depth, the all-encompassing demand of, of Jesus actually apply to me. And, and the people at the end of that sermon, they say, wow, here's somebody who speaks with authority and not like the scribes. So that response is the right one to go, whoa, this guy is really telling me what to do. And that kind of goes against our flesh. Yeah. So let me just take a shot at what I think Jesus is meaning when he talks about his yoke is light and easy. And it all comes back again to covenant. It's, it's, it's recognizing that I'm in relationship with Jesus, first and foremost, because of his servant role in my life, because of what he has done on my behalf. That is the presupposition. Uh, and so when I even start thinking about his grace, I have to recognize that Jesus has fulfilled the law. The demand is done. The demand is provided. So whatever my obedience to Jesus um, looks like. It is not to earn anything. It is not to somehow make God love me better. It's not to ensure that the blessings are going to continue to come to me. We're not in that kind of covenant. We're in a covenant that is already fulfilled. But because of the nature of that grace, if, if, you, can, if you can come to Jesus and, and realize this kind of grace and receive that kind of grace and experience that kind of grace, and then not respond, well, I would simply suggest that you're not even experiencing it. That's The lack of response is evidence that it hasn't actually been received. Grace, I find grace the most mysterious, the most powerful um, concept in the universe. And, it's, and yet it's so vulnerable at the same time. It's, it's enabling, it's transformative, it will soften the hardest heart, um, but it can also be rejected. So learning to live in Jesus' fulfillment of the law, learning to, to live in Jesus' ongoing forgiveness, learning to live, and, and, and I, I tell my students, one of the most important things is that you learn, you practice the reception of God's grace daily. Um, grace all too often is the presupposition of our Christian life. It's, a, it's the proposition that we can articulate and quote Ephesians 2, 8, 9 or whatever, but is it the reality that I'm constantly receiving? That is the biggest question. Because as you continue to receive this grace, it will incline, it will soften, it will enable the will which all too frequently wants to go its own way. And so when I think about the grace, it's not just the cross, it's not just his life, which he gave at such high cost, day after day after day, living in faithfulness to the Father, resisting all of the temptations we are prone to experience. He was, he was tempted to, to pride. He was tempted to lust. He was tempted to to falsehood, all of those things, the writer to the Hebrews says, he experienced. And yet day after day after day, he resisted and he was faithful in depicting it all the way to the very end. But then I also want to encourage uh, us to remember a huge aspect of grace that we, especially in affluent countries, tend to overlook, and that is the whole area that's known as common grace. Uh, Mark, um, I think we've gotten a little bit of your pre precipitation uh, today here in Southern California. For the first time in months, we've got a rainstorm. Uh, we, had, we literally got zero precipitation in November, and we haven't had a rainstorm like this since sometime last spring. But it's just, it's beautiful. It's wet. Is it because all of us in California repented? <laughs> I don't think so. This is common grace. This is God providing for 
uh, people and for his created order provisions that are not tied at all to whether or not we trust him, whether or not we're following him. It's what God and provides. Jesus says that in the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, you're, you're not just making this up out of your head. He actually says God causes his reign to fall on the just and the unjust. I, and I'm so totally with you. Yes, that is absolutely, absolutely God's common grace. Just wanted to give that scriptural footnote. Please continue. Yeah, no, Mark, that's exactly right. So learning then to receive this as a gift, to receive this as grace from God, to receive my health, especially in this context of the pandemic, to receive my health, my ongoing strength as grace, to receive the very breath, to receive the gift of my, the presence of my wife in my life, my sons, my, my breakfast. Plenty of people in the world don't have breakfast. Um, to perceive all of that as grace, as opposed to entitlement, or as opposed to something that I have earned to put on my own table. What does that do to my heart? It humbles me, it softens me, it moves me to gratitude, and it inclines my will to follow even very high demands of righteousness. So I do believe that the way in which to respond, the how question, is to understand that my, my spiritual life runs on grace. It's like the oxygen of my soul. Now, if I'm a, if I'm a great athlete, I can train my body and I can expand the efficiency of my lung capacity and my heart to actually make use of the oxygen better, um, but I'm still dependent on oxygen. I can't hold my breath just because now I'm a world-class uh, athlete. I must have oxygen if I'm going to actually perform. If we understand that grace is the same, performs the same function in my soul, in my discipleship as oxygen does, you realize I can't go a day without it. I can't, I mean, I'm, I'm being graced every moment whether I'm aware of it or not. But the transformative power of grace is nullified if I'm not aware of its reception. And so if I learn how to practice the reception of grace and be conscious of it in all kinds of large and small ways throughout my day, I will be, I think, being led by the Spirit. That's, I think, what Paul is talking about, being filled up to the full measure of the, of the stature of Christ. I am, I am being led by the Spirit to Jesus, and, and he mediates that grace to me. But I must become mindful of it. And if I learn how to live covenantally, where is the grace of the day? Where is the grace for this task, for this whatever is coming down my, my pathway today? Learning to live that way will set you free. Remembering that this is not about earning anything. It's about responding to my servant and my king by his grace, and then the burden becomes light. And, and that, I think, is the beginning then of being transformed into the image of Christ so that it becomes our desire. Why? Because he's just so good and he's so Amen. precious. You made me think of the, the verse, you know, quench not the spirit. There are people, and, and we have done this even as believers who have resisted the grace of God. You also made me think of a not scriptural illustration that is Les Miserables and the, uh, the main character Jean Valjean who receives this amazing act of grace, unmerited favor from the Bishop of Denay. This guy Jean Valjean has stolen the silver of the bishop and he's caught, he comes back in, the gendarmes say, here's the man who stole your uh, silver bishop and the bishop says, oh no, he didn't steal it, I gave it to him. And, uh, oh, you forgot this silver also. And the bishops, you know, uh, maiden uh, sisters, are, you know, elderly spinsters, uh, to use an older word, are just shocked. You know, how could he do this? And you watch in the story how that grace, a very Christian grace, softens the heart of this man and actually does change him. And I've watched over the years since I've read that, both in my own life and in the lives of others. And I believe I could say I've seen people respond to God's grace that way, and I've also seen them resist it. Even that amazing act, uh, which happened in a much more significant, indeed cosmic way at the cross, just ends up being despised by so many people. And therefore, there is no grace in their lives to lead them to repentance, 
to lead them to desire to and then in greater measure fulfill the demands that Jesus gives to the world. Now, I want to read some more incisive words that you wrote at the beginning of your book. You said, many followers of Jesus respond to his climactic fulfillment of the law on their behalf by lowering Jesus' demands. We've been talking about this to the point where they're realistic and then cloaking themselves with his grace for the rest. They're using their, their liberty as a cloak of covetousness, like the way Paul talks about. You said, there is relatively little concern here about what Jesus means by his summons to follow him. Rather, those who take this path define discipleship in ways that demand little of them, lest they fall into a legalistic striving for righteousness. They reason, this is you still, since they are saved by grace and not by works, Jesus' high demand should simply direct them back to him for more grace. If they were to respond by striving to fulfill all of Jesus' commands, they would find themselves denying the gracious nature of their salvation. This, you say, is the path of compromise, and it is rampant in the church today. Now, I completely agree with you here, and for example, I'm super strict with myself about watching any kind of nudity on screen, precisely because Jesus told me in Matthew 5, and I've heard these words my entire life, whoever looks at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And I'm often silently dismayed, John, that I see other Christians watching and praising TV shows and movies that I know contain nudity. Maybe they're skipping those scenes, I just tell myself that. But when do I think my, to myself, this brother is on the path to compromise? And when do I think to myself, before his own master he stands or falls and God is able to make him stand? I don't want to be a legalist. Can you help me uh, apply your own words in a way that's charitable and gracious to others? Mark, this is a really, really good question, and it, it is really difficult. Um, knowing when to speak into someone's life uh, in a way that won't push them further away, in a way that won't uh, offend them to the point of them responding, as you said, with uh, accusations of holier than thouness or whatever, uh, it's really, really difficult. Now, Jesus and Paul. Matthew 18 and Galatians 6, as well as other passages, really does lay at our feet the responsibility to look after those who are within our circle, within our care. Galatians so 6, 2, you who are spiritual, restore the one who's overtaken in a fall. Got to quote the King James here. It's what's in my head. Um, it, it, lest you also be tempted. And considering yourselves, lest you also be tempted. Yeah. And yet, and he also says doing it gently. Um, and then, of course, with Matthew 18, he talks about... Uh, going to a brother or a sister one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. If they don't listen to you, take, bring another uh, person with you. And if they don't listen again, then bring them before the church. And then, of course, if they don't listen, then treat them as a tax collector. Well, um, that doesn't mean we, we show them the stiff arm. Uh, how did Jesus treat tax collectors? He pursued them. So if we do approach uh, uh, somebody with this sort of intervention, uh, it has to be done humbly, gently, aware of our own uh, frailty, and, and, and never giving up on them uh, if we can continue to pursue them the way Jesus did. But things have to be in place if you're going to have this kind of conversation. If you become uh, increasingly burdened by the compromise in a, in, a, in a brother or a sister that's close to you, I think you need, first of all, to cultivate a certain kind of, of relationship. Number one... Um, to the degree that the grace of God is active in your life, to be walking in step with the Spirit in relationship to them, uh, so that they see the effect of God's grace in, in your life, and, and you are naturally um, quick to refer to the effect of God's grace in your life. So you sprinkle your words with that. But then also, uh, I would say, cultivate deeper conversations with that person, so that you don't you don't just stay on the surface of, of work and politics and whatever else, but to go to the deeper things of the word, not necessarily on the topic you want to talk to them about, but, but to cultivate the, the kind of conversational pattern that would lend toward asking the deeper questions of our existence, the deeper questions of what it means to be a believer. And then, of course, bathing this in prayer, because the only one who will actually bring about conviction of sin uh, is the Spirit. And so we have to keep in step with Him 
and, and invite him at every step of the way to lead us and to be working in the relationship. And then when the question or the, or the uh, I should say, the conversation uh, takes place, um, my experience is, is that we have to be really um, adept in asking questions as opposed to giving sermons. So learning and thinking through questions that might allow that person to sort of go down the pathway, him or herself, that you want them to actually go down to, because if they are professing Christians, then you can take certain things as the givens and then ask them, okay, how does that square with this? And, and let them then, it's still going to cause offense, but if you've, if you've been vulnerable prior, if you've had deeper conversations on other talks uh, before this, there may be a better chance for this conversation within the relational capital that you have to, to uh, open it up for the Spirit's work. But it is something that needs to be done carefully, recognizing also that God is patient with all of us. I mean, I, it's dismaying how many times I've, I've had to relearn something that I knew and, and teach every day. Um, and so the same kind of patience that God has with me has to be the framework and the posture from which I then approach somebody else. So I don't know and, if any of that is helpful, but that's... Uh, I think it is. And th these are just, you know, principles of grace applied to my relationship to other people. You make me think, too, of the times when people have had to come to me. And let's face it, most husbands and fathers, Christians, uh, the, the person who has to come to us the most often is, uh, well, in my case, my wife. And she comes to me graciously, and there have been times when the same grace that God has shown to me in Christ, she is showing to me because she's gotten it from him, and I resist. And other times when God grants me repentance, and I listen. And I'm thankful to say I've had other people in my life, spiritual leaders, who have come to me at times and done it with a real grace and a desire to dig deep rather than to stick to those surface issues. God is gracious to me to give me gracious correction through other people. Now, I want to round out our interview. And, you know, we've gotten a little personal here talking about our personal standards of what we do when certain television shows are on offer and how we pursue Christ and obedience to his commands. And I'm going to get even a little bit more personal, but you can determine how personal you want your answer to be. Do you, yourself, find that your work on biblical theology, especially in this book that we've been talking about, do you find that that work has led you to live a more holy life because of the truths in your book that you have so ably taught to others? If so, can you explain a little? How specific do you feel that you could be? Yeah, Mark, I really do appreciate that question as well. It gets us back to this whole biblical theology for life thing, if it's not affecting life. And I'm a professor, uh, and so if if I profess certain things, but those things are not themselves becoming real and transformative in my life, then I'm really being hypocritical. So I I, I absolutely appreciate this. I before I go in to teach, I, if I have time, I I spend some time in prayer, because I know that uh, I'm only. Um, going to be useful in Lord's hands if if my heart is in the right place and that means it has to be in consistency with what I'm about to teach. But I can honestly say that the theology that uh, fills this book is is not my theology. <laughs> it's it's God's. It's it's from uh, His Word, and and so I can honestly say that this approach has changed my life. Actually, this book and the, and the class out of which this book came. Is, is really uh, an autobiographical journey. Uh, it's, it's, it goes all the way back into my, especially my early 20s, my mid-20s, when I, when I became dismayed uh, about the inconsistency of my, of my love and my devotion, my, my obedience to Christ. And I started then to observe my life and, and to ask, okay, what's going on when things are really humming along well? And what's happening when things are not? And I began to see this whole uh, impact of the grace of God. Now, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point to my parents and, and some of my, the elders in my life who taught me grace 
almost Me too. more by example than by sermon. Um, and I saw the effect of grace in their life, and I didn't quite understand it. Um, but as I began to increasingly um, practice the reception of grace, long before I even understood covenant, it began to affect my life. And then as I began to, to, to work hard and trying to understand the big narrative of the, of the Bible and this whole covenantal framework started to come very clear to me, um, it, it increasingly transformed my discipleship. And slowly, painstakingly slowly, um, I've seen transformation. I've, I've seen more victory. I've seen more consistency. Um, but... I know it's only going to be partial in this life because we are only in the inaugurated era of the kingdom. And, and, and so with that partial living in this, with that, uh, that uh, episodic living uh, in this framework, I have hope for the kingdom. And, and I look forward to the day when, when finally I will be single-hearted and I will I, I put it this way to my students, my grace receptors will be completely in tune with the reality of God's grace. I think that's the kingdom. Um, Amen. This is the way that I am to live now, and it's, it's the way in which I will live perfectly in the kingdom. And the, and the area that I would say I could point to that gives me most encouragement that something has changed in my life is my relationship with my wife. Uh, <laughs> my wife and I have been practicing this for decades now and um, it's resulted in a in a one flesh relationship that I never knew could actually happen and I know it's because of the grace of God and so I have great encouragement uh, that this is the way life is to be to be lived both now and uh, in eternity so yeah it's it's pretty important as a pastor um my church recently closed, and but I still have the heart of a pastor for the people that uh, I was pastoring. I still have relationships with them. And I found myself often praying through the Lord's Prayer and kind of camping out on that phrase, thy kingdom come. And somebody explained it to me, one of my own pastors years ago, as meaning that Jesus is inviting us to and ask him to extend his rule. And I think that's true of the entire planet. Your kingdom come, rule this whole place so that there is no gap between what God desires for me and what I desire. And I think it also means, this is the way I've applied it, Lord, would you extend your rule over more portions of my heart, the portions that are resistant, the, the flesh, unite my heart to fear your name. And I think of 1 Corinthians 13, there will come that day when I know, even as also I am known, a day when there will be no gap between God's standards and my performance of those standards. Grace will have overcome all resistance. John, Dr. Lundy, I just can't just say John, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for investing the gifts that Christ has given to his church through you. I'm thinking of Ephesians 4, a passage that's often on my mind and heart in this book and in this hour of discussion. Thank you so much for your time. Mark, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, having me on and for this really, really encouraging conversation. Lord bless you. Praise the Lord. That was a stimulating discussion of important issues. And I think Dr. Lundy demonstrated how very practical biblical theology can and must be. I also think he demonstrated the fruit of the Spirit, love, the only virtue capable of motivating true holiness. Sometimes I do wonder, I ask the Lord in prayer, why theology and the Christian life can be so difficult, complicated, but I already know some of the answers. Apparently God sees benefit in training us to love and think like Him, not merely to do as He says, although we certainly are to do just that. And tracing out the biblical theological covenants is really essential for discovering what God means when he tells us to do various things. Thank you for joining me, Mark Ward, for the Bible Study Magazine podcast. It's been my pleasure to serve you. 
To subscribe to Bible Study Magazine, just go to biblestudymagazine.com slash subscribe. To get some great Bible study resources in my favorite Bible software program, Logos, check out logos.com slash Bible study. Our producer is Kaylee Joyce. Our audio and video tech is Jack Underwood. I'm Mark Ward. Thank you to them. Thank you to you. See you next time.